Hi there, it's uh, Dermot here again, and I'm just going to continue again with uh, some talks or lectures on recovery themes. And just today I'm going to look at uh, relapse prevention checklist, and especially for people in, in early recovery or I suppose any stage of recovery, uh, relapse is always a, a big risk. It's always there. It uh, never goes away. You know, the possibility of relapse can happen. Um, just depending on how you're at, where you're at, uh, you know, what, you, what you're doing. So I'm going to go through just a few things to just kind of look out for um, in early recovery or any part of your recovery. Okay. So physical, behavioral and emotional symptoms leading to uh, a relapse. As I say, a relapse is a process. It's not an event. You know, it doesn't just suddenly happen out of the blue. It's normally a buildup of different things happening, you know, uh, maybe one thing or two things or an accumulation of things that do happen. And it just grows and grows and grows. And eventually the person will then lift a drink or a drug. But I'll just go through some of those, I suppose, those uh, warning signs, as we say. So exhaustion is a physical one. And it, it's very important in that sense. You know, the hungry, angry, lonely, tired, if you've ever heard of that, the halt to stop and tiredness being a big one, you know, tiredness being exhaustion, you know, when your mind is tired, it doesn't function properly. And, you know, you are at risk to making mistakes and doing silly things, you know, so allowing yourself to become overly tired. And then that leads to, as I say, poor health because you'll start to get run down. And when you start to get run down, it'll make you tired again. You know, some alcoholics and addicts, you know, also prone to work addiction, um, across addiction, as they say, uh, perhaps in a hurry to make up for lost time. So they jump in with both feet and think, well, because I've wasted so many years of my life doing this, that and the other, I need to make up, make it up. So they throw themselves in. It's also part of a, a self kind of flagellation or punishment in the person that, you know, they, um, they beat themselves up for, for what they've done or what they feel they've wasted. And rather than taking things slowly, they just jump straight in and then burn themselves out. Good health and enough rest are important. If you feel well, you're more apt to think well. You know, that's very, very true. You know, if you get a good balance in your day, you know, your thoughts and your feelings will, will be a lot better. You know, feel poorly and your thinking will, uh, is apt to deteriorate. And of course, you know, that's, that's, that's definitely going to happen. That's, I suppose, it applies to anybody. And if you feel bad enough, you begin thinking a drink couldn't make it any worse. So if you're run down, yeah, you will become depressed. Your mood will be low. And of course, you'll think, oh, well, what's the point? I might as well have a drink. So it couldn't be any worse than this. Dishonesty. And again, as they say there, this pattern, be, you know, this begins with a pattern of unnecessary little lies and deceits, fellow workers, friends, family. And it's, you know, it's you know, telling white lies, as they say. And I know it's, it sounds a bit silly. It sounds a bit daft. It's the kind of thing you'd say to a child, don't, don't, don't lie, be honest. But it's self-dishonesty because if you know you're lying in yourself, you, know, you cannot lie to yourself because everybody has a conscience and that conscience won't let us lie, so we know. So most people, they're dishonest out of fear because they're afraid they're going to be reprimanded. But it's, you know, rising above that fear, you know, you'll be more reprimanded more if you're found out then, you know, if, if you just, if you, you know, if you've been honest and do something. So the important comes, the important lies to yourself. So as I say, it grows then, you know, the little lies get bigger. And they become important lies to say to yourself. This is called rationalization. And what happens there, then you start to make excuses. And start to say, well, everybody does it or, you know, it's okay. It'll be okay next time. Um, she won't be as bad, you know, I, I know what I'm doing and all this, you know, she start to justify, rationalize and make excuses for yourself. So, you know, you, you're just heading yourself down that road because you're lying to yourself and you're over overriding your emotional side or your conscience. Impatience, the big one. And... With this, things are not happening fast enough. And addicts are impatient people at the best of times. Um, you know, instant gratification was the name of the game in addiction. You know, getting that quick hit, quick fix. So, you know, we didn't have patience. We, we didn't know what it was like to have patience. So we lost the 
the knowing of patients. So when you get into recovery, that's one of the big ones. You want to fix now, fast, you know, don't want to wait. Um, but again, that's something that you have to kind of learn. Everybody has to learn patience. You know, others are not doing what they should or what they want them to, so you're getting frustrated or miserable with them. Argumentativeness, arguing the small ridiculous points of view, you know, indicates a need to always be right. Uh, Self righteousness, uh, and again, yes, that can that that can happen. Some people, you know, from addiction would be kind of narcissistic in a sense, and would hate to be wrong, be very controlling, uh, not like to be seen as not being right, always have to be right. You know, it's, 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 it's there's a fear of being wrong. As it says, why don't you be reasonable and agree with me, rather than saying I accept your point of view and let's move on. And that is looking for an excuse to drink, because it builds up and then the person will storm out, slam the door and say, well, you know, I'm doing this for you anyway. Depression, I'm not talking about clinical depression here because that's a diagnosis. I'm just talking about the mood or the feeling. And most people overdiagnose themselves. They say, oh, I'm feeling down, so I must be depressed. You're feeling down because you're feeling down. And, you know, and we have moods and our moods come and go and they go up and down all day. You know, unreasonable and unaccountable despair. Okay, it happens in cycles, moods go up and down, but you need to talk about it, you know. And as to say to most people in early recovery, don't don't panic if you start to find yourself feeling moody and you don't know why you're feeling moody. You know, you find maybe you, you could be fine in the morning and grumpy in the evening or the other way around, grumpy in the morning and fine in the evening. Or, you know, if you go up and down and spike throughout the day, that's just perfectly normal. That's your emotions coming back. And so they are kind of swinging up and down. So, you know, don't, as I say, don't despair and think, oh, there's something wrong with me. I must be suffering from depression. That'll pass. It does. You know, just get used to it. It's, you know, the best way to deal with the feeling is not to run away from it, but to sit with it and just let it, let it run its course. Frustration. And again, people, because things may not be going your way, but, you know, there's a bot to that. It's normally frustration of yourself because you know you feel that you're not doing or you're not as good as or should be better than. You know, remember everything is not just going the way you want to, and it's not going to happen the way you want to. You know, people have this mindset or this picture or you know this vision in their minds that, you know, or expectation that it's going to be like this, that, and the other. But you know, life, life is not. You can't expect things to happen in life the way you want them to happen. Things happen in life, and that's just what life is all about. Self pity or the the, the poor me's. You know, why do these things happen to me? Uh, you know, things happen to everybody all the time, every day. You're not the only person who's sitting on the pity pot. Everybody has trials and tribulations in life. Why must I be an alcoholic? You didn't draw the short straw. You should be saying to yourself, thank God I'm an alcoholic. At least now I know what's wrong with myself. At least now I know why whenever I drank, I couldn't control it. Or whenever I used, I couldn't control it. I know this now and I know what I can do. And I'm on a program that can help me better my life. Nobody appreciates all I'm doing for them and changing that around. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for yourself. It has to be for yourself. You know, if you start doing things for other people, you get resentful. Arrogance. I've got it made. I no, fear, I no longer fear alcoholism. Uh, going into drinking situations to prove to others you have no problem. You know, and that's you know, arrogance, but it's just plain stupidity if you ask me. You know, um, alcoholism never goes away addiction never goes away because that is inside of you it's not in the bottle or the pill or the drug the addiction is inside of you and it'll always be inside of you it doesn't come out so you know to it's like waving a red flag to a bull you, know, you wouldn't do that unless you're waiting to get hit by the bull and that's what you're doing so to start thinking well i'm better than this i've got it licked i know what i'm doing you don't you're only fooling yourself Saying it didn't bother me, you know, do this often enough, 
And you've heard the saying about the barber shop, you know, you sit in the barber's chair long enough, you're about to get a haircut. And it's the same thing. People fool themselves and say, well, I went out and I went to a party and it didn't bother me. They're all sitting drinking. They all got drunk, but it didn't bother me. I was glad I was sitting there with my glass of 7-Up. It didn't bother me. You know, I've heard this a million times in my job, you know, and it did bother them because they did end up drinking. Complacency. So drinking was the furthest thing on my mind. I wasn't even thinking about it. You might not have been, but when you're complacent, you let things build up. You know, disciplines start to go. You know, and it's like anything in life. It doesn't even have to be with addiction. You know, it can be with exercise. It can be with studying. You know, once you start to take your foot off the gas, it starts to go. So not drinking was no longer a conscious thought either. So, you know, I wasn't thinking about the drink. So I don't know why it happened. Now, as I said there, disciplines, it's dangerous to let that up on disciplines because everything is going well. And that's what happens to people. They think, well, I'm feeling great. I'm looking great. You know, everything is working for me in my life. You know, I've got my job back, my family back. Um, couldn't be better. So I think I'm okay now. I don't need to do all those silly little things they told me to do whenever I was in treatment, like meditate and hand over and give thanks and go to meetings. I don't need to do that. I can just uh, stay at home and watch telly and take the dog for a walk and go f f meet my friends down the pub. You know, having a healthy respect, you know, and that's a healthy respect for the power of addiction and the power of alcohol and all that, because remember, as I said, it comes from within. So it's good to have a little fear. Um, I don't want you to be petrified or terrified. That would also be counterproductive, but to have a healthy respect of the power of addiction and alcohol on you. And again, more relapses occur when things are going well than otherwise. So more people do relapse when things are going great than when things are going bad, because when things are going bad, your awareness is, is, is heightened and you're looking out. When things are going good, you take, you know, your guard down. Expecting too much from others. You know, I've changed, why hasn't everyone else? And I kind of covered this as well. And you know, and people do change in, especially if they go into treatment, into a treatment program, they cannot not change because that's the way the program works. They're living with other people in a confined you know, uh, environment. There's a routine set up for them, a different group work, as you know, it goes along. So of course you're gonna change, you're not gonna stay put. But you know, when you think you leave your home or wherever you live, they're not changing, they're doing the same thing day in, day out. Your family will be the same. You know, if you if you if you left your dirty underpants on the floor on the bedroom, they'll probably still be there when you go back. Um, but everything will be the same. So it's not that because you changed, everyone else has changed. That doesn't happen that way. You know, it's a plus if they do. Um, and that's very rare that they do. Yes, they'll be happy to see you, they'll be happy to see the changes in you. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to change their behavior because of you. Um, if they don't, it's still your problem, you know, so you still have to look after yourself and change yourself. And focus on yourself, not them. And again, they may not trust you yet, you know, um, they may still be looking for further proof of your recovery. And that's perfectly normal because, you know, how many years were you in addiction for? How many years were they watching you? trying to outwit you, you know, you're trying to outwit them. It went on, it was a cat and mouse game for years. So of course there's gonna be no trust, even if you did go into a treatment program, you know, when you come out, yes, you might be, might have changed, but they don't know that. They don't know what your thinking is like. You know, they just remember you for what you were like before you went in. So you have to give time time and you have to, trust has to be earned. And you cannot expect others to change their lifestyle just because you have it's not going to happen, you know, and the more you expect it won't happen. But if you just keep changing yourself, you will start to see changes in other people. You know, they do adapt, but don't expect it to happen. So again, going back to letting up on disciplines, as I said before, you know, the, the prayer, the meditation, daily inventory, AA attendance, you know, these are not set up just to um, ruin your day or, you know, take time out of your day or piss you off. You know, th these are set up because they work. 
you know, and prayer is in a sense to say prayer is just asking for help. Meditation is sitting listening, listening, you know, listening to yourself, grounding yourself. The daily inventory, um, the step 10, you know, it's very important. These are all things, you know, that in any self-improvement program you could do today, this is what they would encourage. They encourage people to pray. They encourage people to meditate. They encourage people to journal and write down their day and plan their day, you know. And for recovering people, AA attendance or NA attendance is very, very important. It's part of your recovery program. So, you know, you need to keep those things going. Now, I know people in treatment will have started this um, and will be doing this on a daily basis. Keep it up, you know, because at least you've started it. So keep it going, you know, because once you stop, it's very hard to restart again. And again, this letting up can stem from complacency or boredom. Um, two things on board but you know if you make it part of your routine your daily routine you do it in the morning in the evening and you have a set meeting you're going to go to set a certain time certain day you just do it you know don't think about it just do it make it make it like make it a plan like getting dressed or putting your shoes on just do it make it part of your routine so you can't afford to be bored with your program and you can't be bored because the only reason why anybody's bored in recovery is because they had so much time, they spend so much time in active addiction, either using or drinking or planning their use or planning their drink or being preoccupied by it, that their mind never had a chance to actually stop and think what else was going on. So, you know, it's boredom is a, is, a, is, a, is a state of mind, you know, so there's plenty of things to do, even around the house. Don't be sitting there, you know, in a filthy house saying, I'm bored. Now get off your ass, get the hoover out and hoover the house or clean it or do something. You, know, you have no excuse. And the cost of relapse is always too great. And letting down disciplines, and that, that is what will happen. Because suddenly you start to think you're very much alone, you're isolated, you become introverted, and bang, what else do you expect? Use of mood altering chemicals. Right, you may need the feel, you may sorry, feel the need to ease things with a pill, and your doctor may go along with you. Um, yeah, now doctor's prescriptions, you know, you have to go along with them, but it's your responsibility to tell your doctor that you have an addiction if he doesn't know or she doesn't know already. Don't just sit back and assume that they know, because you know if you tell them, look, I am chemically dependent, I suffer from drug addiction or alcohol addiction, they will know what to give you to help you. Now, in circ certain circumstances, yes, you might need stronger medication. Uh, you might need to be put on morphine, for example, if you've got, you know, if you're going for an operation or severe pain. But that is monitored, you know, and you know, if, if that happens in, in the hospital, you know, they know how, just how much to give you. They're not going to overdose you either. You know, I mean, you may never had a, have had a problem with chemicals other than alcohol, so you know. But you can easily lose the price. What happens? You always go back to your drug of choice, and no matter what, you'll always go back. You know, you could be an alcoholic, never drink, start to take Valium, for example, or other benzodiazepines, and end up going back on alcohol. Or you could take cannabis or cocaine, and you end up going back on on alcohol. You know, and it's a subtle way to have a relapse. Remember, you will be cheating if you do. Conscience, and don't say I didn't know you do. <laughs> you know, the reverse of this is true for dependent persons who start to drink. You know, we get people in, in uh, come into treatment or come into care and say, well, you know, I wasn't uh, an alcoholic, you know, I was a drug addict, so why can't I drink? And you say, well, why can't you drink? Is because you go back to your, your drug of choice if you do. And that's just the way it'll happen. It's the same with the gamblers. You know, people come in for gambling. But I don't have an alcohol or drug problem, so why can't I take alcohol or drugs? Again, you know, they're mood altering substances and you'll end up gambling. But we'll move on to wanting too much. So don't set goals you can't reach with normal effort. And it's good to set goals. It's good to come out of your comfort zone. It's good to challenge yourself. There's nothing wrong with that, but within reason. Remember, the first two years of recovery are a transition period. So don't be overloading yourself and, you know, doing biting off more than you can chew. So if you're going to set a goal, set something that you know within yourself that you can achieve. 
and focus on that goal. Don't do 10 million goals and not make any of them. So not expecting too much and don't expect too much of yourself. It's tough enough to staying sober the first two years. So don't be expecting too much. Don't be putting too much burden on your shoulders or anybody else's or letting anybody else put too much burden on your shoulders either. It's always good when good things you weren't expecting happen, happen. And that does happen. And it does happen more than not. You know, um, if you let lower your expectations and you increase your gratitude for what you do have and your appreciation for what you do have and people around you, you do start to see miracles happen in your life. You'll get what you're entitled to as long as you do your best. You know, maybe not as soon as you think. And you know, if, if you've ever heard of the law of attraction, you know, that's how it works. It takes persistence and consistency because you could be asked for something, asked for something, asked for something, and then give up, you know, get it. Um, but if you keep asking and it will come and it might not come the way you want it, you know, um, you could say, oh, I'd, I'd, I'd love to go on a holiday. You know, it's not just going to manifest a holiday in front of you, but it'll give you the idea of how you can do that, how you can maybe raise the money or plan a holiday or, or whatever. So happiness is not having what you want, but wanting what you have. So what you do have, you appreciate it and you enjoy it. Forgetting gratitude, as I said before, you know, you may be looking negatively on your life, uh, concentrating on problems that are still uh, not totally corrected. You know, so don't focus on the negative if you can. Focus on what you have and what's working for you. You know, remember what you didn't have when you were in active addiction. Remember the pain, the physical pain, the emotional pain, the mental pain that you were going through. And just be grateful that today you're not going through that. And that's all you have to be grateful for. You know, grateful for your family that stood by you, you know, or other people who stood by you. The doctors, the professionals, the other people who helped you. You know, be grateful for that. Grateful that you're able to wake up. You know, it's important to, to, to write a gratitude list if you can of things that you're grateful for, even if it's one thing in the day. You know, as you're going through the day, notice things that you're grateful for. You know, it could be a sunrise. It could be flowers, you know, whatever it is, you know, just note that in yourself. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I'm able to see these things and appreciate these things. And again, nobody wants to be a Pollyanna and that's happy all the time. You can't. Um, but it's good to remember where you started from, you know, in the dark days of addiction and how much better life is now. And just, just to appreciate that, it is. It can't happen to me, so going back to that again. This is dangerous thinking. Um, again, the addiction is inside of you. It's not in the bottle or the pills or the drugs. And almost anything can happen to you if you're careless. So just the complacency again, so just going over that. So just be careful of that. Remember, this is a progressive disease. And you'll be in worse shape if you relapse. And that always happens. You do go back to worse shape. The addiction, the, the nature of addiction is, it, you know, the memory stays in your subconscious mind and your subconscious mind never forgets. So you could be off the drink for 20 years, go back drinking and you'll go back drinking exactly what you left off drinking. Your body won't be able to handle it because it'll be like it'll go into a state of shock. But your mind will tell you you can. So if you were drinking a bottle of brandy a day, you know, 30 years ago when you stopped drinking, if you relapse, your mind will say you can drink that bottle of brandy. Omnipotence, or as you call them, an ask hole. Lovely word. It's a feeling that results from a combination of many of the above that we've talked about. An ask hole is someone who asks for advice constantly but never acts on it. You do not have to have all the answers for yourself and others, and you don't, and you won't. None of us do. You know, we're not God. We don't have our answers for ourselves. Life is just that. Life is a journey. Life is a mystery. Things unfold as we go along. We cannot know everything, you know. That's why we're always learning. That's why our brains are pliable, they're plastic, they're constantly growing. You know, so we're always, always learning. We never get to a stage where suddenly bing, you know, the the the, the tank is full, we've learned enough. That never happens. If no one can tell you anything, if you think you know it all, well good luck to you. Ignore situations or advice from others, and that's going back to the ask bit. 
you know, listen to them, ask questions, but don't do it. You know, in that sense, that's a part of arrogance, you know, and relapse is probably imminent, you know, unless changes take place. So if you keep thinking that you know it all, you can do it all, no one knows it any better than you, you're the one who's going to fall, nobody else. And then apathy, the last but not least, and I suppose apathy is the, the lowest form you can get yourself into. And this is a, a state of kind of deep or very, very low mood, even depression, deep depression, clinical depression it could be as well. It's a feeling that a person just gives up. You know, just suddenly just think, oh, what's the point? What's the point in anything? What's the point in life? What's the point in living? What's the point in this, that, the other? So it's worse than just relapsing in a sense because people who are apathetic, you know, um, given half a chance, they will act on that apathy. You know, um, their outlook would be completely bleak and they would become suicidal. And some people, you know, other people who have been suffering from apathy have completed suicide, especially if they've relapsed and go back to drinking or using again. That's given them what they call the Dutch courage to actually go through it. Yeah. So just to conclude, so no one in their right mind wants to relapse in a sense. Nobody really does <clears throat> because it does bring back bad memories, bad feelings. Um, they don't want the pain. So nobody wants to relapse because they know it's painful. It's painful for themselves. It's painful for them, for their families. But the main cause of relapse is wanting to drink using gamble. So there is always that want or that desire, even though the person knows they can't, they still have that desire. And that's just, again, it is, is normal. It's just a progression. You know, you just can't, you can't just turn it off like a light bulb. Um, so people who do go back, you know, the one thing is, I don't know why I drank. So you, you drank because you wanted to, you know, you know, you couldn't, but you wanted to. Um, so it's working through that and it does take time before that desire dissipates and then people start to accept more. So as addicts, we cannot afford to do this as we will do our utmost to justify the relapse of blame. That's the first thing you do as soon as the relapse happens, finger pointing you start straight away. It's this, that, the other fault, this happened, that happened, this, that, that, that. So they don't take responsibility for the relapse for themselves. It's because of, you know, you can't do that. You can't, you can't blame because, you know, you're just admonishing yourself of responsibility. You have to be responsible for your recovery. And part of that recovery is you have to take responsibility for your relapse. So to avoid relapsing, you know, just do the suggested things. You know, not because you want to, but because you need to. It's as simple as that. There's a lot of things, sacrifices we have to make in early recovery. We have to change friends. We have to stop you know, socializing, we have to stop going to certain places, you know, yes, it's hard, but it has to be done, you know, you have to go to A meetings, I know most people hate them in the beginning, they hate their aftercare, you know, but you have to do it, you have to persevere, because if you want, if you're desperate enough to be in recovery, you'll do whatever it takes. And then the rest will eventually fall into place, so you look at it like a big jigsaw puzzle, and that's what I say to people, Recovery is like a jigsaw puzzle. There's thousands of little pieces there and it doesn't make sense. But when you start to put them all together slowly, slowly, and they all start to fit, you start to see the bigger picture. So I think, ah, now I see what this is all about, and why this is happening. And, and now I see an, an, an outcome. And, you know, 90% and of the time, the outcome is good for people. They like what they see. Right, so that's the end of that one. Thank you very much. And, and I'm sure I'll have another talk on recovery coming down the line. Okay, well, take care and, and have a, a lovely day, All right?